Today, we are thrilled to have Emma Jordan, a renowned expert in cultural intelligence. Emma's journey is a testament to the power of cultural understanding. With over 15 years of experience working across diverse cultures in the Middle East and Europe, she's become a sought-after coach and a trainer in this field. Emma's passion for cultural intelligence stems from her belief in the transformative power. She is dedicated to helping individuals and organizations navigate complexities of a multicultural workplace with ease and effectiveness. Of the assignments of individuals moving from their home country over to the UAE, 70% um, of the ones that fail are because of the family feeling, feeling unsettled. But cultural intelligence goes deep into thinking about, you know, strategies that we can put in place so that we can work effectively with people from different cultures. So it isn't just about cultural awareness, um, but it's about how can I then take that awareness and apply it effectively um, and think about what changes do I need to make each time I make an interaction with somebody else? What are the differences that I'm likely to face? What are the similarities and how is that going to play out in our interaction? And how might I need to flex my approach so that that interaction is effective? In this interview, we'll delve into the importance of cultural intelligence in today's globalized world. Emma will share her insights on how to build cultural awareness, bridge cultural gaps and foster inclusive environments. So join us as we explore the fascinating world of cultural intelligence with the insightful Emma Jordan. Before we dive in, in this treasure trove of wisdom, here is a little something from the heart. You know, every subscription, every like, every share means the world to us. It's not about numbers. It's about the incredible community we're building together. So if you haven't already, make sure to hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and share with you this, this one with your friends. It's more than just a support. It's a journey we're taking together to spread these great minds and even the greater story. What's up, Monday Talkers? Here we go again with another episode and another shining star. Today we've got a, a coach and she's all about empowering individuals and organizations with cultural intelligence for global success through tailored training programs and coaching. Joining me today, Emma Jordan, the founder of and CEO of Infinite Consulting, right? Hi, Emma. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Emma, you've worn many, you've worn many hats. Entrepreneur, sales, service learning, development, coach. Who's Emma at her core and what drives you to keep going? Um, so, yeah, thank you for that. So, um, Emma at her core, um, I'm a... Uh, a founder, you know, a CEO, but I'm also a wife. I'm also a mum, and I um, I really am somebody that cares about community, uh, and somebody that is a bit of a connector. And I love to help to make people feel included and part of something. Um, I hate any of these exclusive groups, and so um, yeah, what my focus is always just to try and bring people in and, and help them to feel part of something. Cool. So what's the story of Emma? So the story of Emma, so I have been a learning and development professional for 15 plus years. Um, I did most of my career in the corporate space, which uh, took me across different places around the world, here in the UAE, the wider Middle East, continental Europe, and obviously where I'm from in the UK. Um, and that then gave me lots of experience and exposure to lots of different cultures. And that really got me inquisitive to learn more about different cultures and how does that play out in the everyday, you know, in our everyday life. Um, and so that set me on a journey learning about cultural intelligence. Uh, and I then decided to get facilitated in cultural intelligence. Uh, and and then since I've set up my own learning and development consultancy, consultancy that now specializes in cultural intelligence. Beautiful. So you love what you do. Absolutely. Amazing. So you are or you're looking for Ivan and you got so much recognized to be a thought leader in this cultural intelligence where the growing global presence 
especially in UA. Let's start by defining what do you mean by cultural intelligence? Absolutely. So cultural intelligence is the ability to work and relate effectively with people from different cultures. So you can see how it's very apt for this particular region where we have so many cultures living and working together. Beautiful, especially in UAE. Absolutely, yeah. But cultural intelligence goes deep into thinking about, you know, strategies that we can put in place so that we can work effectively with people from different cultures. So it isn't just about cultural awareness, um, but it's about how can I then take that awareness and apply it effectively um, and think about what changes do I need to make each time I make an interaction with somebody else? What are the differences that I'm likely to face? What are the similarities and how is that going to play out in our interaction? And how might I need to flex my approach so that that interaction is effective? Okay, so let's think about it this way. I have this environment, I'm the HR, and I just like look to have homogeneous uh, environment. This is the dream of any HR, right? And um, how do I know that the 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 uh, the culture intelligence is is helping me to move forward or or is it measurable something i can measure yeah there's lots of different ways that we can measure cultural intelligence so you know if if somebody feels um included in the workplace and it's a multicultural workplace then something's going right in that organization mm -hmm. um you would probably expect to see you know pretty positive uh, employee net promoter results. You'd probably expect to see, you know, if you were seeing levers, you would probably expect to see some quite, quite positive comments in there. Um, but, it, you know, hopefully you would see that people weren't actually or didn't actually want to leave the organization. And so your attrition rate would potentially be, you know, lower as well. The reverse of that is you've got a culture where people don't feel included, they don't feel valued or respected or heard. And so what you then get is a, a pretty disengaged organization, uh, individuals leaving regularly, and then your exit interview notes will probably, well, if people are honest, will probably give you some honest feedback about what's really going on in your organization. So cultural intelligence, when applied in the workplace, helps to make sure that um, we're, we're thinking about ways and means we, we can actually include all different people. So even if there is a dominant culture in, within a workplace in terms of, you know, there's a dominant nationality within the workplace, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that the way that that nationality does things is, is the right way, well, or the wrong way for that matter. Um, but what we need to do is when we think about bringing people in from different cultures into an organization, how can we help them to feel part of something? And our cultural intelligence is, is a great deal part of that. How do you find the right pattern or the right formula that works for diversified individuals coming from different background of cultures, you know, Indians, Arabs, uh, all, all that? types of, of, of just like a different culture background if i want to set up a this office it has to have one let's say environment that is working fine with everybody so how can i set yeah. up this environment standard to make it working for everybody so I think once we become aware of all of the different cultures that are within our workplace, we will then start to see how we perhaps approach things in entirely different ways from one another. And that can be anything from the way that we communicate or the way that we build relationships with our colleagues, um, or it could be, you know, the way that we um, negotiate our sales, the way that we work as a team and so on. Um, once we become more aware of those elements, we can then start to think about, okay, and how do we want to work effectively together we might be tackling something in an entirely different way to each other. But what's the right way for our organization? What's the, the right way for our brand? What do our clients expect from us? And once we start to think about those things, we can then um, put together, uh, you know, kind of a way that we do things around here, like a roadmap of this is how we do things in our organization. This is the expectations that we have of you as our employees. 
um, and then we all ca can be held accountable to, you know, that way of doing things. Um, and we all, and in that respect, then we all need to kind of fall into this is the way that we're going to communicate with our clients. This is the way that we're going to, um, you know, make decisions within the organization. This is how we conduct meetings and so on. Okay. So uh, at the beginning, when you were defining the uh, cultural uh, intelligence, you said people feel they want to stay, people feel they want to leave, which means emotions, right? It's it's hard to measure emotions in 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 world of human, let's say, and this is really tough. So expressing emotions depends on cultural background as well. So how do you define the amazing synergy that we have here in the UAE? How does it work? And what's the relation between culture and emotion? Yeah, so, um, well, so there's uh, obviously emotional intelligence, EQ. Cultural intelligence, CQ, is kind of a step on from emotional intelligence because typically when we get educated about our emotions, we get educated about them within our own cultural context because all different cultures, as you say, express their emotions in entirely different ways. So you could be highly uh, emotionally intelligent within your own culture but if we then picked you up from your home country and dropped you down here in the UAE you wouldn't necessarily be able to apply that same logic in terms of the way to manage and regulate other people's emotions um, and so cultural intelligence basically takes emotional intelligence one step further and says and how do we apply that across different cultures um, but you're right, cultural intelligence uh, or culture itself is a very emotive thing because we're talking about the uh, the specific values that individuals align to. It's why, what do I believe in? What are my assumptions? What are my, uh, you know, what's important to me? Um, what's important to me and my family? It might be a wider thing. It might not be just what you think. It might be what does the whole group of, our, of, of us think it might be family or it might be team in the workplace. Um, so, it, yeah, it really does um, does play on people's emotions. I mean, there's there's some stats in terms of, as an example, people that are um, relocating to the UAE, there's about 70 percent of the um, of the assignments of individuals moving from their home country over to the UAE. 70% um, of the ones that fail are because of the family feeling, feeling unsettled. You know, that's all about emotions. It's all about, you know, how can you make individuals feel like they are, uh, you know, that they belong, that this this is their home, um, that, um, that they can feel, uh, you know, that they fit in really. Um, and so emotions really do play a key part in, in uh, cultural intelligence. Let's go beyond the, the atmosphere of the corporate. UAE in general is a big country and they're doing a great job. I mean, how do they succeed to make this cultural combination or cultural merge into a very successful environment, a dream of everybody outside in the world? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the UAE's key messages in, in previous years, and it kind of continues into current day, is that uh, tolerance is is a, a key word that, you know, tolerance is really important here in the UAE. You, um, we tolerate one another in terms of we, uh, you know, we will allow each other to be the people that they want to be. Um, you know, there's lots of... Um, um, regulations in the government in terms of we have the freedom, for example, to um, to follow our own faith in this country, even if it's even if it's not Islamic faith. Um, we're allowed to, uh, you know, live here even though we're not nationals of this country. Um, there's lots of different things that are, um, you know, that, that happen and are allowed in this place that enable individuals to. Um, feel like that they can make this place home uh, because we, you know, because everybody has this kind of camaraderie uh, about that we all kind of allow each other the freedom to live kind of how we want to live. Amazing. Actually, everybody who tried living in Dubai feels home, 
even when you land at the airport, you feel home already. Okay, let, let, let's go back to the corporate, inside the corporate. And they say, as an HR, my duty is to assure well-being of my employees. What, what are the symptoms I should pay attention to to understand that I have a cultural gap? How can I sense this gap? I think, yeah, you'll you'll probably have quite a disengaged um, uh, set of employees. You might see certain trends, for example, in certain departments. So if, if there's um, certain issues within one uh, function within the organization, you might see um, that there's perhaps a, a, you know lots of different conflict. There might be grievances um, that have meant been raised. Um, there might be a high attrition rate. Um, you know, as I say, employee surveys might indicate that uh, that we're low performing at the moment in those sort of areas. So there's um, there's quite a few indicators that help you to see there's something going wrong at the moment and um, you know, we, we need you need to then explore it and investigate it a little bit more because it, it might not necessarily be something that all employees are feeling as well. If you've got a certain demographic of people in your organisation, it might be only those individuals within your organisation that are feeling um, that they're not valued, that they're not respected. So if you were to look at the broad spectrum of um for example, your employee net promoter, it might indicate generally that you're, you know, a high performing com company. Um, but then there might be, as you drill down into uh, the different reports from the, the different surveys from your employees, you might see a few individual ones that indicate that there's a certain demographic of people that are unhappy. Um, and it's and it's that where you need to then pay attention. So it is great to get a great overall employee net promoter score, but it's not okay just to take this high score and say, well, we're we're scoring, you know, 85, 90, so we're doing really well. Um, because we need to be looking at the, the, you know, the detail really and seeing what does the detail tell us about how our employees feel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how can I recognize if it was the emotional intelligence or cultural intelligence is what I have missing in my environment? As an HR agent. So I think in the UAE, it's it's highly unlikely that uh, individuals will be, um, you know, working within a monocultural organisation, meaning that there's only there's only one culture. So highly likely that if it's here in the UAE, that the problem is more of a cultural issue rather than an emotional issue. Um, but those emotions might be arising because of the culture and the values at play within like one employee versus another. Um, so, you know, it might be that um, an individual is a, an indirect communicator and they feel that um, the person that they're dealing with has been speaking to them very rudely um, and um, disrespectfully. And then when you investigate it, you might realise that actually you've got, you know, very something, something very simple, which is an indirect communicator working with a direct communicator. And so the indirect communicator finds the direct communicator, com communicator quite you know, rude, abrupt and blunt. And so um, they've been taking offence to that person and the way that they communicate to them. When in actual fact, what's happening is just that they communicate in a more direct way in that culture. So educating individuals within your team to start seeing these different, these cultural differences and also similarities to then start to kind of take less offence. And just, I think we often... Um, immediately look at the other person for to blame for the reason why something isn't working you know whether it's um the reason why i you know i feel offended or the reason why um um you know we're in conflict it's the other person's fault but actually sometimes it takes us to look inside ourselves to recognize ah actually let me just pause a minute we're having this conflict what's causing this conflict Am I seeing a difference in the way that I communicate versus the way that the, they communicate? Let's not immediately jump to the assumption that this person's really rude and is trying to offend me and disrespect me. Maybe if we just pause and thought, I wonder if it's because they just communicate in a different way to me, then we might then start to, you know, we could just then have an open conversation and say, hey, you know, like sometimes when you speak to me, I, I like I feel like you're quite blunt. And I'm not really sure how to take that, whether you mean it in a disrespectful way. And I think if you 
kind of had those open and transparent conversations with your colleague, they probably don't even realize that they're being that offensive because it's just the regular way that they communicate with each other. Mm. So at that point, you'd be able to then say that, you know, they would be able to respond and say, gosh, I hadn't appreciated that, you know, I was causing that much offense to you. And they could be more mindful then when they're in those conversations. I love this. Let, let's go to, back to this. Like everybody who tried living and working in, in the UAE, notice this one thing, like there is one nationality of each company. Like this is American company. This is English company. This is really dominating the environment, which means even hiring will be like uh, uh, having more dominant number of employees to be American or to be English or to be Indian. And they all work together and support each other, even different hierarchy in the company. So if I, as maybe as a, a different culture, joining this team in, in any kind of competition or whatever, I got this chance and I joined this team. I have to adapt. So what is the healthy environment? Should should they should the employee adapt and feel uncomfy communicating through with the with the with the other employees through their and to their culture, let's say, uh, or there is some kind of different environment that is that has different cultural standards. Which is healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great question. So let's assume or let's imagine that we've got a, um, you know, monocultural team here in the UAE. So it's just one nationality all working together. And then the organization hires somebody in from another country at a senior level and says, right, this is the new boss, guys. This is, the, you know, th this is now who you report to. But the way that they approach things is entirely different to one another. Um, so, you know, one of the the first things we should be doing is kind of educating our team to better understand each other's cultural values um, so that when, you know, um, when there are interactions with the team, we can then start to see why, the, you know, why the manager behaves in a certain way or why the team members behave in a certain way to make sure that, you know, that when the manager joins, the team as a whole can kind of hit the ground running. Um, you can't have a situation where we say, well, um, just because you're the only person from this culture or just because you're the last one in, you now need to just conform. There, there has to be um, a, kind of a mid ground where we then say, OK, well, this person communicates in a different way or this person makes decisions in a different way. Um, and so, uh, you know, or even like I say, the simplest thing of hosting a meeting across different countries around the world. The way that a meeting is conducted is entirely different, even mm. down to the seating plan. You know, in some cultures, yeah. the senior person sits at the head of the table. In some cultures, the senior person sits in the middle of the table. Um, you know, so there's there's even just the basic things like that of, of, you know, your new manager comes in, he comes from a culture where they sit in a different position. On the very first meeting, you can, could end up like offending the manager because you've sat in his seat. <laughs> And you've mm. not done it intentionally, but we've not then discussed how does that work across different cultures. And so immediately we've caused some friction in a, in a meeting. Um, so it's just really like simple stuff like that. We also need to talk about. Nice. OK, let's go to stats, just like you mentioned. And there is a very one, a very interesting one that says 40 percent of all overseas assignments fail with the employee uh, repatriated back home without completing their objective. Yeah. The cycle, the cycle for hiring and layoff is really painful for HR people. Yeah. Is there anything related to cultural misalignment that can enhance or reduce this hiring firing issue? Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about the stats, so it can cost anything up to and past this, I would, in my opinion, but um, the stats suggest that it can cost about 500,000 dirhams to 
um, relocate a senior person from overseas to here in the UAE. Mm -hmm. I, I would say it's probably more than that. But that figure comes from things like, you know, you have to let them come over here and do look-see visits. Do I want to live there? Is it a nice place? Can I see myself there? So there's the costs of the flights and the accommodation, even just for those visits. Then you've got all of the uh, flights to get them over here, the, the cost of getting their content over here uh, from their homes. Uh, and, and so it becomes a very cost, costly um, uh, relocation move to get somebody here. But as you say, then, 40% of those uh, relocations fail, you know, yeah. before the person's actually met their objectives. And 70% of those fail because of the family not mm. feeling comfortable. So it's not even necessarily the assignee. It's actually the family that's coming with them as well that can heavily in influence that. So if, for me, the, the key thing that, that, that I capture from those stats is what we're not doing as organizations is supporting our employees on the kind of educational journey in terms of what is the culture like that you're going to how does that differ from your own and what are the similarities but based on those differences and similarities um what challenges are you like to likely to face um and also thinking past or beyond just the new employee you have to think about how are we supporting their family as well? These cultural educational pieces that that um, that we that we host don't just need to be with the the employee. They need to go beyond that. We need to also be thinking about: Are we helping the spouse? Often, when somebody's on an assignment or you know coming from their home country to here, if they're married, their partner has potentially given up their job and their career to mm. come with them on this journey. Now, that individual then has to work out trying to find a new job, trying to build a network and a, and a you know, a professional community around them in order that they can then kind of pick up their career. And that's not easy. Um, you know, if you're not known in the region in terms of, you know, you're not known in your field with other professionals, it isn't just a case of applying for a job on LinkedIn and then you've got it. You have to, you know, Dubai or the UAE is very much a place of who you know, not what you know. So, mm. uh, but people don't necessarily realise that when they get here. So, how are we building uh, building up that spouse, and how are we, you know, helping them to connect, and how are we helping them to, you know, get back into the workplace, as an example? Um, or it might be um, that the spouse it, um, it doesn't work, but then they're very isolated. They're sitting at home all day with no friends, nobody to communicate with. The only people that they can contact is the people that they know back from, back home. And family and friends are probably likely saying, well, if you don't enjoy it, just come home. <laughs> and so before you know it, the assignment comes to an end. So it's really important that organizations think about how are we giving our employee um, cultural education but how are we also supporting the family as well? And that can be as simple as putting them through some cultural coaching sessions so that they then start to come to grips with the cultural values um, of the country. And, and that doesn't just involve learning about UAE culture. It also involves learning about all the different cultures that you're going to come across in this country. You know, you're not going to only work with Emirati people. You're going to work with people from all different places from around the world. So we need to come to grips with what is that like then if you're juggling you know, one of my clients has 86 different nationalities working for them. Wow. So how do you juggle that in the workplace? You, you know, a team might consist of 20 different nationalities. Um, so you, you need to make sure you equip them with all that information before they arrive here. So what do I expect to gain when I register for cultural training? How can I measure success in cultural intelligence or cultural so knowledge? So um, when you're relocating, the success of your relocation is a unique one and personable to you. What success looks like for you might look entirely different for somebody else. So that is part of the conversation that we have. What would success look like for you if we were to kind of jump you into the future to two or three years ahead of now and say to you, you know, what would you like to have achieved? What does your family life look like? What does your professional life look like? What does your personal life look like? Um, and the in, the employee or the assignee can say, you know, these are the things that I think would make this move here successful. And then we can work with that individual to then think about, okay, well, how can we then help bring that about in, in quite a smooth way? So 
um, I can help support individuals get connected into different networks. I can um, connect them with different suppliers. You know, it's quite often when you're a new employee that you don't want to go to HR and say, how do I do this? Where do I go for that? Because people are always worried about whether they would look incompetent, whether their technical ability to do the job might be assessed on the fact that they don't know how to set up their utility bills. Um, and so they don't really want to ask HR, so they just fumble along and actually they could go through a session um, where they actually hear about, you know, what what are your top priorities as part of your daily living to get you settled here? And that might be, I need your help setting up utility bills. Fine, we can do that. But past that, it's also about what are the cultural values that you will experience here within the UAE? What's um, key for the culture within this region? You know, it, you, the UAE is very um, family focused as an example, um, the Islamic values thread through your personal life and even into your professional life, even if you're not a Muslim. So these are some of the things that you need to be culturally aware of so that you can then be effective when you're in the workplace. Mm -hmm. This is like for individuals. Yeah. What if uh, for corporates? What what uh, what uh, this intelligence uh, cultural intelligence course can bring on the, to the table for me as an HR? So, for the cultural intelligence course basically equips people with strategies that they can put in place so that then when they are working with different people, they can be more effective. So when we talk about strategies, we're saying, okay, so you're about to go into a meeting with people from different cultures. Have you thought past beyond the agenda? Have you thought about who's in the room? Have you thought about um, how their culture will influence the way that they will share or communicate during that meeting? Have you thought about um, the way that your culture impacts yourself in that meeting? Um, and then once you start to think about those things, you then start to think about how you might plan more effectively for that meeting so that it's a conducive meeting. But during the meeting as well, part of your strategic thinking is kind of thinking on your feet in terms of what am I witnessing? What am I seeing here? Is it what I anticipated I would see in the meeting? And if not, what are some other strategies that I can put in place now that I'm aware of, uh, you know, the kind of constraints of this meeting um, that I might need to adopt in order that this meeting is effective. So we we would, in our training, for example, put people through different role plays or different case studies, just some really engaging activities to try and um, put some of these um, learnings into practice in, in the classroom, in a safe environment, so that people can feel like, uh, you know, they, they get different methods and different approaches to, to kind of work with people more effectively. Yeah. Okay, Emma. Out of my um, just like my journey of of hitting you with questions, you have the mic. Uh, uh, you just like uh, uh, let's enhance the audience confidence. And what golden nuggets of advice would you uh, address the audience today? Um, I would say that most people aren't aware of their own cultural preferences, their own cultural values. And so for me, the key thing would be, um, how can I become more aware of my own cultural value preferences? Um, because once you become more self-aware, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you start to then look inward at yourself to think about how you could influence a situation rather than always looking to blame another person. So my key nugget would be if you want to be thinking about cultural intelligence, think about how can you learn more about your own cultural values so that you can be more effective when you're working with other people. Beautiful. And lastly, for anyone who wants to dive deeper into your world, connect with you, how can they find you? Website, social media, spell the beat. <laughs> okay, so I'm on LinkedIn, Emma um, Emma Jordan with a double A. Um, otherwise, you can find me on our website, uh, infiniteconsultingme.com, um, or you can email me at emma.jordan at infiniteconsultingme.com. Beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, a giant Monday Talks with you today, Emma Jordan. Thank you for joining us. This conversation has been very insightful. And I know the audience is feeling empowered. Until next time, stay curious and stay informed. And remember, 
Cultural intelligence is a powerful force and significantly enhances synergy of our diverse teams. Let's cultivate and leverage it to our advantage. To all our viewers, remember to follow, like, subscribe to Monday Talks and for more insightful conversations like this one. Until next time, stay empowered and keep the smile. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. Bye-bye.